Let's praise Jesus in this place this morning. We have the students in the building. Come on, we praise you, Jesus.
as you can tell, I'm the only one up here on stage, so I need your help as a church. Come on, y'all need worship from me this morning, okay? So what, I, what hallelujah means is praise the Lord. So we're here to what? Praise the Lord. So we have raise a hallelujah to you, Jesus. His presence is here. Let's go sing. Raise a hallelujah. Presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah. Louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah.
thank you for Jesus who made a way when there was no way. Lord, help us to be changed as a result of being here this morning. Pray that you be with our pastor as he opens up your word. We love you. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Today is part two in our series, Forge, and we're studying through the book of 2 Timothy, and the illustration that we're using is that of a blacksmith that is forging a piece of, of metal. And so we kicked things off last week. We talked about the, the first thing we want to do as you're, as you're forging metal is to get the furnace hot. And we were talking about our own relationship with God is we want to be hot for him. God wants us to be passionate for him. He wants us to be on fire for him. Let me tell you how encouraging it is for me to see all of these students worshiping God and on fire for him. Can we give them a hand? So we had uh, 200 kids at fall retreat, so I can't wait to hear all about that. So last week we talked about being on fire for God. God doesn't want us cold for him. He doesn't want us lukewarm for him. He wants us hot for him. He wants us on fire for him. He wants us passionate about him. And we talked last week about fanning into flame the gift of God. And how do we fan the flame of God in our lives? We talked about coming to church. We talked about worship. We talked about prayer. We talked about, about fellowship. So we want to be on fire for God. And we want to be around other people who are on fire for God, the people who are surrounding us so that, so that we can burn bright together. So what I want to talk about today is being in the fire, being in the fire of God, to be in God's refining fire. And I want you to picture in your mind that you're in the fire and then he is molding us and shaping us and making us. So you think about when, when metal hits metal, it's not a very pleasant sound, is it? It's kind of a, it's kind of annoying, kind of annoying sound. I, I was watching the LSU Tigers yesterday play Mississippi State and they were in Starkville and they had cowbells. You know how annoying a cowbell, have you ever been around a cowbell and someone's shaking a cowbell and there's like thousands of people? Like if you ever find yourself being surrounded by thousands and thousands of cowbells, you might be in hell. I'm just saying, like, that, that, that's not where you want to be because it's such an annoying, it's an annoying sound, right? Well, even more painful than hearing the sound of metal hitting metal is being hit by metal. Have you ever been hit by metal? Like, have you ever hit yourself? Like, I, I'm not too much of a handyman. Jennifer likes to tell people I'm not, I'm not very handy around the house. But I've smashed myself with a hammer many times. Have you ever been hit by metal? It's not a very pleasant feeling. Uh, when Jolin was little and he, they were across the street play, playing in one of the neighbor's yard and Jolin was swinging, swinging a golf club and when he followed through on the golf club, he hit the neighbor on top of the head <laughs> and like blood, blood went everywhere. You ever been in that situation? And I'm thinking to myself, he needs to go to the hospital. Like, like he's going to need some stitches. Like, that's going to leave a mark, right? Well, the dad, he just, he just shaved the kid's head and put some butterfly Band-Aids up there. They were missionaries, right? No big deal. Don't need to go to the hospital. It's just, it's a mere flesh wound, right? Um, 
When Jennifer and I first got married, we led a group of college students. We took a mission trip to Belo Horizonte, Brazil. Okay, this was, this was before we had kids. Jolan jo was actually made in Brazil, um, but that's maybe too much information. <laughs> too much information. This was before kids. And in Brazil, soccer's real big in Brazil. And so we played soccer all the time with the, uh, with the college students down there. And I was playing goalie one day, and, and the ball was coming towards the goal, and I was running out to the ball, and another one of the college students was running. And we kind of got to the ball at the same time, and when I went down to, to pick up the ball, he went to kick the ball, and he kicked more of my hand than the ball. And my ring finger was going this way. Like I looked up, you know, and like my ring finger's going this way, and so it was, it, we, we weren't sure if it was broken, dislocated. So they rushed, they rushed me to the hospital, and we're at the hospital there in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. The doctors speak in Portuguese. We don't speak Portuguese. Jennifer speaks Portuñol or Port, Portuñol Inglês, kind of combination of all three. And so they were trying to take the ring off so they could relocate the finger, fi fix the finger, and they couldn't figure out how to get the ring off. And so he got this, this Dremel drill out, and he starts drilling trying to cut the ring off. And I can tell this isn't going good because I'm smelling my flesh burning <laughs> because of the heat that it was creating. I wanna talk about today about being in the fire. <laughs> and metal hitting, it, it's, today's, today's message, it's not a feel good message. Just gonna go ahead and just, just put it out there for you. This is not a, a feel-good message, but I think today's message is, is, gonna, is going to speak into each of our lives, because every time we open the Word of God, God pow powerfully speaks into our lives. We're in 2 Timothy. We're reading through 2 Timothy. We're in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I'm going to cover the first 13 verses. We're going we're to go one at a time and, and walk through it. 2 Timothy 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. So we have the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy was his son in the faith. Timothy was, was his disciple, and he's writing this letter, words of encouragement, words of instruction. This is, this is what he says. Be strong through God's grace. Life is full of hard knocks. Life is full of ups and downs. Life is full of peaks and valleys. Jesus said in John 16, 33, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you'll have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Jesus said in this life you will have many trials and many sorrows. And so Paul is telling Timothy, no matter what you're faced with, no matter what challenge you're going through, no matter what trials you're facing in life, be strong through God's grace. He's not telling Timothy to man up. He's not telling Timothy to toughen up. He's not telling Timothy to cowboy up. He's not telling him to be strong in and of his own strength. He is encouraging him to be strong through God's grace. Now, the apostle Paul is speaking to something that he has a lot of experience. And we can go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 through following. This is what Paul says. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Have you ever begged God to take something away from you? Like you're going through something, you've got this challenging situation, and you're saying, please, God, please take this away. He said, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What is Paul referring to here? What is, what is the context of this, of this passage? What, 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 is he, what is he talking about? He, he's referring to a thorn 
in his flesh. Paul, Paul's referring to a thorn in his flesh, and he mentions it over and over again. I've got this thorn in my flesh. Well, what, what is the thorn in the flesh? We're not sure what the thorn in the flesh was, but it was some type of challenge, some type of difficulty, some type of weakness that Paul is asking God to take it away, but God doesn't take it away. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. My grace is all you need. When we are weak, God is strong. Do you have a thorn in your flesh? Do you, have a, do, you have, do you have a thorn in the flesh? I believe all of us do. I believe we all have something. It, it's a weakness, it's a difficulty, it's a challenge. It's something that God uses to mold us and to shape us and to make us who he wants us to be. It's something that causes us to depend on God, to, to rely on God, to to trust God, not depending in my, on my own strength, but I wanna be strong in the Lord. And Paul is telling young Timothy, no matter what you're going through, no matter how big the mountain in front of you, no matter how impossible the obstacle, no matter how far you fall, no matter how big of a mistake you've made, whatever's going on, be strong in the Lord. His grace is sufficient for you. His grace is all you need. And I wanna say the same thing to you. No matter how bad you've screwed up, no matter how low you feel, no matter what kind of a mess you've gotten yourself in, God's grace is sufficient for you. He can clean up your mistakes. His grace can wash us as white as snow. No matter what challenge or difficulty you're facing, take heart, because Jesus has overcome the world. So don't be wise in your own understanding. Don't be strong in your own strength. Don't trust in your own abilities. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in God's grace. See, we're saved by God's amazing grace, but we also live out the Christian life by his grace. It's his grace at work in our lives. We're to be strong in the Lord. Ephesians 6.10 says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Now I shared this last week, but it, but it bears repeating. Is you have Holy Spirit power, okay? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've accepted Jesus into your life, you have Holy Spirit power. The Holy Spirit is in you. And we looked at the first chapter last week. God didn't give us a spirit of fear. God didn't give us a spirit of timidity. He gave us a spirit of power, Holy Spirit power. The same power that rose Jesus Christ from the grave lives in us. We have Holy Spirit power. His grace is sufficient for us. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. The difficulties of life are gonna come. Be strong in the Lord, be strong in God's grace. Stand firm in your faith. Build your life upon the firm foundation of God's word. And then he gets in the, the second verse there, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So this is the verse that I share at the beginning of every semester of men's discipleship. This is our discipleship verse. This is, this is the multiplication verse. You have Paul discipling Timothy, Timothy discipling reliable men, reliable men discipling others. It's the process of multiplication. We're to take what has been entrusted to us and pass it on to others who are then gonna pass it on to others. I've been talking a lot with the men in my group about being fat. I want you guys to be fat. And I pray that you would be fat, right? Looking for some fat men. Are you fat? <laughs> Faithful, available, and teachable. Okay, it's an acronym. Are you reliable? Are you faithful? Do you, so, so we're like, we're in book three, so there's a lot of homework, there's a lot of assignments. Like, are you doing the work? Are you faithful to do the assignments? Are you available? 
Are you able to come on Tuesday nights? Are you able to come on church, to, to church on Sundays? And are you teachable? Are you willing to grow? Are you willing to learn? Are you willing to make some changes? Are you fat? And so the whole idea of discipleship is, Paul's saying, I'm, I'm discipled you, Timothy, you're the disciple, reliable men, reliable men, disciple others. So as we're a part of this process, we, we wanna multiply our lives. We wanna have spiritual great-grandchildren. We wanna have people that we disciple, that disciple others, that disciple others. It's the process of multiplication. And then in verse three, three through seven, he, he uses some real, really cool analogies here. It says, endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. And athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to enjoy the fruit of their labor. Then he says, think about what I'm saying. The Lord will help you understand all of these things. And so he gives three examples, a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. And then he says, pray about it. God's gonna give you insight into what I'm, what I'm saying. So what do these three things have in common? A soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. What, what, what do they all have in common? Well, several things. Hard work, discipline, endurance, perseverance, focus, determination, purpose. In verse three, he says, endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Now this idea of warfare, battle, war, soldier, this is a theme that's common throughout the Bible. Now the Bible is written, is penned by 39 different authors, but we know that God is the author of scripture. Like he, he's, he wrote the whole story. And over and over again in the Bible, we have this, this battle theme, this war theme. Paul is reminding Timothy, we're in a war. We're in a battle. We're in a spiritual battle. We're in a battle of good versus evil, a battle of right versus wrong, a battle of angels versus demons. Whether you know it or not, every day we're, eng we're engaged in spiritual warfare. There is a spiritual battle going on. And one of the things that God has called us to do is to raise, this, to raise the temperature, the spiritual temperature. Our focus right now is prayer. We, we, are, we, are, we are winning the war on our knees. Our elders and our staff, like, like we're, we're, we're engaged in this spiritual battle through prayer. And he says to endure suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Now, this is the fourth time the Apostle Paul has mentioned suffering in his letter. Like, like we're, we're on page one, and he's already mentioned suffering four times. He says, I want you to endure suffering along with me. So Paul is suffering. Paul is in prison. Paul is about to be executed for his faith. And Paul says to endure suffering he doesn't say, if you're going, if you suffer, then endure it. Okay. Like, you are going to suffer. Like, it's not an if you suffer. You will suffer. The Christian life is full of suffering. See, there, there's a common misconception in the Christian life that if you follow Jesus, you won't experience any pain or suffering. This, this is a false uh, assumption. Because once sin enters the world, Genesis chapter three, the fall of man, there's suffering. Right. It's a part of living this life. We experience pain and suffering. We go all the way back to Genesis chapter four, you have the story of Cain and Abel. Now, you know, a lot of us are familiar with the story of Cain and Abel. They both brought a, a, an offering to God. Abel's sacrifice was acceptable to God. Abel pleased God with his life. What did he get for it? He got killed. Doesn't seem fair, does it? I mean, he's the one that brought the acceptable sacrifice. He's the one that was living a life pleasing to God. And his brother Cain kills him. 
There is suffering in this life. He didn't do anything wrong. And in fact, when you take a stand for what's right, you're gonna get some persecution. There's going to be some suffering. If you're not experiencing any persecution, if you're not experiencing any suffering, you may not be standing firm on the truth of God's word. So we see, we see this throughout the scriptures. Fast forward to the New Testament, John the Baptist. Jesus said he was the greatest person to ever live. John the Baptist is the one that pointed people to Jesus. John the Baptist is the one who baptized Jesus. And what did he get for it? He got thrown into prison and got his head cut off. King Herod had this, you know, this exotic dancer dance in front of him and pleased him so much that he said, I'll give you whatever you want. And she says, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. John the Baptist was walking with Jesus. And he dies in his early 30s. All the disciples, 11 of the 12 disciples, were died for their faith. They were martyred for their faith. And John, the only one who wasn't martyred for his faith, was exiled to the island of Patmos. The apostle Paul, you read about his story, read about all the pain and suffering that he went through. I think there's this misconception that Christian life, that everything's gonna be perfect and everything's gonna go my way and everything's gonna be peaches and cream and everything's gonna be life down easy street. It's a misconception. We're soldiers, we're in a war, we're in, we're in a battle. And you better put on the armor of God and you better make sure you're in the foxhole with, your, with the right people because the bullets are flying. The bullets are flying. So we put on the helmet of salvation because the enemy is gonna attack our minds. We put on the helmet to protect our minds, protect our thoughts, to take every thought captive. The breastplate of righteousness to protect our hearts, to protect our purity. The belt of truth, we're, we're going into battle for him. We're standing on the truth of God's word, the peace shoes of the gospel, the shield of faith, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then he says, don't get involved in civilian affairs, the things of this world. The Christian life is not simply butterflies and rainbows. Philippians 3, 10 and 11, this is what Paul says. I wanna know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. And wanna suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I'll experience the resurrection from the dead. If you want to be raised with Christ, you first have to suffer and die with Christ. Amen. There is no resurrection without a death. We first have to die and then he will raise us. This is, this is what Jesus said in Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. We are to deny ourselves. We're to take up our cross. We're to die to ourselves every day. We're to allow, allow him to crucify the flesh every day. We are to endure suffering like a good soldier. And then, then, he, then he uses the example of an athlete. And like an athlete, if you wanna win, he says you have to compete according to the rules. There are no shortcuts to spiritual maturity. You have to put in the work. There, you cannot just take spiritual steroids. You cannot cheat your way into the kingdom of God. We all have to run the race that God's marked out for us. And I talked about this last week, but we all have a unique gifting and calling. God has a different race that he wants each of us to run, and sometimes we get to run these races together, but you have to run the race that God's marked out for you, what he's called you to do. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training, they get a crown that will not last. You're talking about the Olympic Games and you know, a, crown, a wreath crown. They get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever, eternal life, eternal crown. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a, like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, 
I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. And then he uses the example of a farmer. The farmer shall be the first to receive a share of the crops. Farmers work hard. Farmers uh, wake up early. They, they work from sunup to sundown. Farmers till the soil and they plant the seeds and they tend the garden and they pray for rain and they wait patiently for the harvest and then the farmers reap the harvest. There's hard work in reaping the harvest. So in order to be successful as a soldier and as an athlete and as a farmer, it takes discipline. It takes hard work. It takes determination. It takes endurance through suffering. We have to push through the pain and not give up. So we only get a reward in the Christian life if we finish the race, if you persevere to the end. In heaven, there's no such thing as participation trophies. I know our kids, our kids are used to participation trophies. If you participate, you get a trophy. But in the, in the Christian life, you only get the prize if you finish the race. I've been talking a lot about this the last few weeks, but not everybody's getting to heaven. Not everybody's getting the prize. It's only those people who persevere to the end, the people that are on, on the narrow path that leads to eternal life. And this journey can be painful, but there's purpose in the pain. God uses trials to develop us. James 1, 2 through 5 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So trials test our faith, and enduring through trials gives us the opportunity to grow, to grow spiritually, and grow in perseverance. To grow and persevere, that leads to wisdom and maturity, and they lead to being complete in Christ. And so God allows things to happen in our life, to mold us and to shape us and to make us into who he wants us to be. He is the potter and we are the clay. Or for our illustration, he is the blacksmith and we are the piece of metal. I want you guys to check out this video. And God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man when God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part. When he yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a man that all the world shall be amazed. Watch his methods, watch his ways. How he ruthlessly perfects, whom he royally elects. How he hammers him and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him. Into trials shapes of clay which only God understands while his tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hand. How he bends but never breaks when his good he undertakes, how he uses whom he chooses in which every purpose fuses him. By every act induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about. So when we're in the refiner's fire and God is molding us and God is shaping us, and he is banging on us and chiseling away and smoothing out those rough, those rough spots. It can be painful. Romans 5, three through five says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not, does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. And so when God is banging away, and God is chipping away, and God is hammering away, and, and when he is bending us and shaping us and making us, it, it's a painful thing. It's uncomfortable. 
Isaiah 48, 10 says, I have refined you, but not as silver is refined, rather I have refined you in the furnace of suffering. Have you ever been in the furnace of suffering? It, it is a painful place to be. Zechariah 13, 9 says, I'll bring that group through the fire and make them pure. I'll refine them like silver and purify them like gold. Like gold. They will call on my name and I'll answer them. And I will say, these are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. When God puts us through the refining fire, there is purpose in the pain. And he is shaping us and he is molding us and he is making us into who he wants us to to be. See, God sees in you what you don't see in yourself. There's a story of this artist who lived in the neighborhood, and this huge flatbed truck comes into the neighborhood one day, and is carrying this huge piece of granite, this huge block of granite. And all the neighborhood kids are getting excited because they don't, they don't know what's going on. And they, they drop off this big piece of granite, and they, they put it in the artist's garage, and and all the kids say, what, what, are you, what are you gonna make out of, out of this big piece of granite? And he said, well, come back in a few months and, and you'll see. And they would ride their bikes by and the, the uh, artist is in there hammering away, chiseling away, working. And after a few months, the kids come back and he's, he's, got, it, he's got it under a blanket. And he says, do y'all, do y'all wanna see what I made? And they say, yeah. So he pulls the blanket off and it's this beautiful carved lion and one of the boys says to the artist, how did you know that lion was in there? How did you know that lion was in that block of granite? See, God knows what's in here. And he is molding and he is shaping and he is making and he is refining. And it's not always pleasant. <laughs> but we have to trust him in the pain. Trust him that he knows what he's about. And he's gonna finish the work that he began in you. God will complete the work that he began in you, Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's a promise from scripture that God's gonna finish the work that he started in you. And this is how Paul finishes this passage. Uh, verse 11 through 13, he says, this is a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we will also live with him, right? If we endure hardship, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. A lot of people talk about what is the unpardonable sin? The only unpardonable sin is denying Jesus, if we deny him, he will deny us. And he says, if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. This is one of the most powerful verses in all of scripture. If you haven't been paying attention, maybe you've been daydreaming, I don't know what, what you're thinking about, I need to get everybody's attention. Like, let's, I, want, I want everybody to get this. Because this is one of the most powerful verses in all of Scripture. He says, if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. If I have no faith at all, he is still faithful. I claim this verse every Sunday morning. I claim this verse every single Sunday morning because I feel so unworthy. I feel so unworthy to preach. I feel so unworthy to be a pastor. I feel so unfaithful. I think about all the sins I've committed this week. It's like, who, who am I to get up and preach your word? And I claim this verse every week even when we are faithless, even when we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. His grace is sufficient for you. When we are weak, we are struggling with that thorn in our flesh, 
when we're going through difficult times, his grace is sufficient for us. The kind of person God uses, it's not the person that's got it all together. It's the person who's depending on God. It's the person who's trusting in God. It's, it's the person who realizes, I can't do this in and of my own strength. It's in my weaknesses that, that he is strong, that he is powerful. So application today, I want you to think about being in the refiner's fire. And what is it in your life that God is speaking into? What is, what is a sin that you need to confess? What is a, a character flaw, a character weakness that, that you need help with? What, what is a, uh, something in your life that God is banging away at and he keeps reminding you at it? You're, just, you're convicted of it. So in, in everyone's seat, we put one of these note cards. And I want you to write whatever it is, whatever God is speaking to you, whatever impurities that need to come into the refiner's fire, I want you to write it down. And at all, at all of our, our campuses, the bands are gonna play. And we have this cauldron. We're gonna have these across the stage. And I want you to put this in the refiner's fire. I want you to bring this to the altar. Now, originally our creative team, we, we wanted to have fires up here and we were gonna like burn these. <laughs> but we couldn't figure out how to make that work without the, the smoke alarm going off and the sprinkler system. So we're gonna burn these this week, okay? We're gonna collect all the, all the things that we're bringing from all of our campuses, from all the services, and we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna burn them, we'll video it. We're, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna put them in the fire, right? So whatever it is you need to turn over to God, I wanna encourage you to bring it to the altar. Let him work in your life. Let him move in your life. Let him take your life and make it what he wants it to be. All right, let's pray together. God, this message today is, is not a feel-good message. It's a convicting message. But God, I thank you that you love us enough to discipline us. You love us enough to bring us into your refining fire. God, we thank you that you are the potter and we are the clay. And you are molding us and you are shaping us and you are making us into the men and the women of God that, that you want us to be. And it's painful sometimes when you're chipping away at those rough spots. But I pray to God that we, we would come to you we would turn it over to you. We'd come to your altar. We'd come to your fire. God, I pray that you'd burn away the impurities. Make us pure. Make us a, a clean and holy vessel to be used by you. God, help, help us to realize that, that your grace is sufficient for us. And I pray, God, there's anyone here, anyone watching, anyone listening who doesn't know you, I pray today would be the day of their salvation. God, your grace is sufficient for them. We don't get to heaven through being good people. We get to heaven through what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for us. And if that's you, I wanna encourage you to put your faith in Jesus. He'll forgive you of your sins. He'll make you whole. He'll make you complete. He will give you eternal life. So God, we wanna respond to you right now. We want you to have all the honor and all the glory. We pray it all in Jesus' name, amen. You can respond accordingly. You guys want to move, stand, whatever you want to do. Here's where you need us. Take me there, take me there. What you need is just an offering. It's right here, and my life is here, and I'll be a living 
sacrifice for you you're a fire the refiner i want to be consumed i want to be tried by fire purified you take whatever you Your glory wants to come in. Let it fall, who we want it all. Lord, for your fire is consuming. Fill this place, set it ablaze, and I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're the fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried by fire, purified. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried by fire, purified. You take whatever you
my words for sure I got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do And every song and you never do So I throw up my hands And praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much of us. What a privilege and opportunity to be able to sing to Jesus. Amen, church. We're singing to him. He's given us breath. We can praise him. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion in
praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much But I've nothing else fit for my King Except for a heart singing Guys, y'all can have a seat. Can I get an amen real quick? Oh, that was a little weak. Students, come on. Can I get an amen after that? All right, that's what I'm talking about. My name is Justin Wojak, one of the pastors. And man, what an incredible morning it is that we get to worship together. If this is your first time, I want to encourage you to fill out our communication card. This is the best way for us to get connected. And if this is your first time, we'll make a $5 donation to our local food bank in your honor. So as you can see, we have a ton of students here this morning. Again, we had over 200 students this entire weekend giving their lives to Christ. And so, yes, that is it. And so part of that their next step is baptism, just publicly saying, I am giving my life to Christ. And so if that is you, let us know on that communication card because we celebrate this at the end of every month. So as we move into a time of giving, this is something that we love to do at Grace Home. There's four ways to give. So as the ushers make their way down, uh, you can give right now in the service. We have two kiosks, super easy to do out in the lobby. You can give online, you can mail a check, but because of your giving, because of you and your family are continuing to worship, I got this video I wanna check out as the offerings being passed, so check it out. The Next Gen Room has been the perfect space for our third through fifth graders. It has been incredible getting to watch their eyes light up when they walk into the room for the first time. They get to experience upbeat worship, games, interactive Bible lessons, and have small group time to where they can connect with each other and learn more about the Bible. At a young age, we want the kids to know that church is supposed to be lots of fun and a safe environment for them to learn more about Jesus. Not only is this room used on Sunday mornings for our kids, but we also get to use this room on Wednesday nights for our students, grades six through 12. Uh, we have an amazing experience here on a Wednesday night from worship to teaching into our small groups. Each area is designed just to give kids a place to meet and come agree. If they're gamers, we've got a game corner for them. If they just like to sit and relax and eat snacks, we've got a lawn area for them over here. We've got a cool living room setting for small group space. And we've also got a few booths for intentional spaces for kids to meet, congregate, hang out, and grow closer together. And parents, don't forget 9.30 on Sunday morning discipleship down at the office for your students. Grace Stone, thank you. Because of your giving to the Christmas offering, we're able to have this space to reach the next generation for Jesus. Oh, let's go, let's go, let's go. So as we end today, I want y'all to realize, parents, families out here, that our students and kids are not our future because if we do that, we're missing out. Our kids and our student are number one mission field right now. And because of you, guys, y'all are making an impact that are changing lives for all of eternity. Because you don't know, because of you, you're giving, somebody be, became a follower of Jesus and their kids are gonna be a follower of Jesus. So guys, y'all are making a huge impact. We are so thankful for you. Now we are dismissed. Have an amazing Sunday. Students, let's get some rest. Monday's coming. So guys, y'all are dismissed. Have a great Sunday.